Ahmed from Benin. And the third was Ellen Gallagher, who's an African-American African -American and Irish parentage. So each show, in quite different ways, challenged the way which non-artists, non white artists, have been marginalised by art institutions in the West. And it was kind of recognised or widely perceived as quite a kind of significant moment. So um, uh, this is a work by El um, Salahi from 1965, and it's called A Vision of the Two. And El, El Salahi trained at the Slave in the 1950s, and then went back to Sudan, and he developed his own kind of quite distinctive kind of modernist painting. Um, and the Tate Modern Exhibition was, was subtitled A Visionary Modernist, and one of the things it was trying to do was to reinsert um, Al Salahi into a history of modernism. Um, and you know, it's interesting because he's actually been living in Britain since the 1990s, but even so, he's been sort of widely overlooked. <coughs> Um, and one of the things that that exhibition was acknowledging, I think, was that there's not just <coughs> one history of modernism that kind of emanates from, from Europe and, and North America, but the modernism has developed in many places across the world it, and has different temporalities. Um, it's developed through kind of very complicated um, histories of migration and transnational dialogue. So it has different meanings in, in different parts of the world. Um, by contrast, Meshach Gabba's exhibition was a um, very different kind of, of, of art practice. So it was the latest installation of an ever-expanding project that he's been working on since the mid-90s called um, the Museum of Contemporary African Art. And um, it was a response by the artist to the fact that when he went to visit um, European museums, he couldn't imagine how the art that he wanted to, to create could, could be integrated within them. So he, well, he says, I needed a space for my work because this did not exist. Um, so um, the Gabba's Museum of, of um, Contemporary African Art had many different rooms in it, and it had spaces that included a museum shop, a library, but also, um, um, this is what you're saying here, is the, the religion room. So at the opening of the exhibition, you could go and have your future led by a, a fortune teller. So, I mean, this idea of, of, of art um, creating spaces for sociability is one that's quite familiar to us, but I think one of the other things that this book is raising is the question of the ways in which um, African art, everyday objects from Africa and artefacts, and indeed the lives of African people have been represented in, in Western art museums. Um, another room that the museum included was, was this marriage room, which documented his own marriage, which took place at the Stedlick Museum. Um, so the personal and the public are intertwined in quite sort of interesting ways. And just lastly, um, the, the, the other show that was on this summer at the time <coughs> was Ellen Gallagher. And um, I'm going to talk a bit more, I'm going to return to her work later on, but um, just to say briefly, her work draws on, uh, draws widely on, on the sort of history of representations of our culture. And what she does here is she's taking adverts for hair products. And um, she's put um, yellow plasticine over them, so they kind of look like extraordinary sort of space age kind of um, creations. Um, which also taking out the eyes and making the eyes white, so something kind of alien about these these figures. And she creates work. You know, sometimes her works are quite small, but they're shown in massive quantities, and they create quite an extraordinary impact. So this is what was going over on in the, in the summer in, in London. And also, in the early autumn, there was the, the first African art fair, 152-54, which was, took place at the same time as Freeze. And um, so it's a sort of open question, really. I mean, so the organisers of these events and the curators of these, of these exhibitions were saying that this was quite a significant shift um, in terms of the representation of all white artists in major art institutions in London. On the other hand, others were pointing out that all these questions of race and representation and um, uh, how to challenge discrimination have been raised many times before. So what is it about this particular moment that's significant or different? Um, so what I'm going to do in this lecture is really sort of circle back to some kind of key moments over the last, since the late 80s really. Um, and um, the text for the reading for today gives a really sort of useful overview of, of some of the kind of key ideas related to post-colonialism, particularly Paul Gilmore's notion of the Black Atlantic. So those ideas are kind of going to permeate this lecture, and I'll be expanding on some of them, particularly on, on um, Fanon's um, uh, writing at certain moments. Um, okay, so so I'm going to go back now to um, <coughs> talk about when 
so what you see here in these pages are kind of a kaleidoscopic assemblage of images that represent a kind of Western colonialist imaginary from Orientalist paintings of women in, her, in, in a harem, which is a kind of uh, a style of a, a sort of trope or, or topic of painting that became fashionable in, in uh, 19th century Europe and usually had very little relationship to the lived realities of the, in the Middle East. You know, you have um, Josephine Baker rubbing shoulders with Jenny Riefenstahl and, and Billy Holiday. Um, and you have um, endless images from films that depict um, colonial exploration um, and images often of black women um, appearing as mysterious and, and sexually available. One of the things that these images acknowledge is that, that in the 19th century, photography and the first forms of, of cinema, of the moving image, um, were often used as tools of colonialism and tools of ethnographic um, work. And it, they, what they did is they made it possible for Europeans and, and North Americans to record glimpses of other cultures in far places. And um, these, these disciplines of, of psychiatry, of anthropology and medicine, were founded on a, a division between Western rationality and science, usually gentleness as white and male, and other forms of knowledge and experience that came to be described as primitive or savage. So the pioneers of photography and the moving image, they rarely questioned those kind of power relations that enabled them to take, make images of, of other people's lives and to represent other, other cultures and so on. But at the same time, the first forms of, of cinema were featured in kind of um, fairgrounds and sideshows. So um, from, but also in the grand exhibitions of the, of the late 19th century. So across Europe and North America in the late 19th century and early 20th century, kind of revolu um, evolutionary ideas about race, racist ideas about, about race and racial hierarchy were introduced to millions of contexts um, through um, the ways in which um, other cultures were represented. So just to give a kind of notorious example, um, in 1894, the Antwerp World Fair featured a reconstructed Congolese village with 16 authentic villagers, most of whom died of while seriously ill. Um, most infamously, um, a young Persan woman called Sachi Bartman was brought from South Africa to Europe in 1910, and she was displayed on the entertainment circuit in England and France and became known as the Hottentot Venus. Um, so she died when she was only 25 years old, and her, after her death, her body was dissected, and the parts, her body parts were taken to the, the Ethnographic Museum in Paris, the Musée de Long. So, at the roots of many sort of familiar visual tropes is a kind of pathological um, obsession within Europe and North America with the black body performed, exhibited, and sometimes literally dissected. Um, so it might seem that. Um, it might seem that Magicians of the Earth um, was trying to sort of redress the imbalances of colonial structures by creating some kind of level platform for art practices from different parts of the world. One of the things that's interesting, though, is that the title of the show, Magicians of the Earth, takes from a book by somebody called Franz Fanon, who in the, in the um, uh, late, in the 1950s and 1960s, was, was um, uh, part of the um, struggle for independence in Algeria against French colonialism. <coughs> and he wrote a very important book called Wretched of the Earth, which was a kind of call to arms for people across the third world to um, rise up against um, their colonial masters and, and free themselves using violence if necessary. And Fanon was a very interesting and very important figure. He was a psychiatrist from Martinique. He'd gone to France um, feeling himself to be a French citizen, right? and he'd, he'd actually fought against the um, against the Nazi um, uh, against Nazi Germany with the Free French Forces, and then after the war, he became very disillusioned with the idea of himself being French because of the racism he encountered, and he wrote a book called Black Skin White Mask, which was actually his, his PhD, where he was drawing on. Um, Lacanian psychoanalysis on Sartre, um, but also on his own experience as a black man, experiencing racism in, in France and in the Caribbean. So really sort of theorised for the first, one of the first kind of attempts to theorise in the psychology, the psychological effects of racism. 
important scene that he describes in Black Skin, Black Skin, White Mask, where he talks about being on the train after the war, immediately after the war, still wearing his soldier's uniform, <coughs> and a white child with its mother points at him and says, look, mummy, a black man, I'm frightened. And he, he describes in great detail how this experience has shattered his sense of self, and he suddenly understood himself to be through um, the stereotypes of white people kind of about black people. Okay, so it's a very important um, theorization of race. So what magician, what the curators of Magician de la Terre did, the magicians of the earth, they took from the title, <coughs> Retro de Earth, a highly politicized title, and changed it to something that was much more apolitical, magicians. Um, and indeed there were thick ways in which the, 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 the choices that the curators made were also quite revealing. So, um, so for instance, this is a work by uh, the Chilean artist Alfredo Jar, which is a comment on, on the sort of, uh, dumping of toxic waste in, um, in Africa. And it was noticeable that many of the Western artists who were, who were, who were chosen for the show made these kind of conceptual, highly politicized works. Whereas, this is in the Catalan, um, this artist, Vesna Philidor, who's from Haiti, was, was depicted within his community, um, often depicted, you know, his own body depicted, making work. Um, just to sort of do a little bit of a spatial analysis of the show, um, which some of the artists, some of the Western artists were kind of commissioned to go to marginal areas and make works responding to what they found. So um, this scene from the exhibition shows um, a work by uh, um, Richard Long, who, who went to Australia and um, worked with the uh, Duma uh, community. Oh, but what he actually produced using work on their land was this um, this work on the wall which actually is no different from the other work for me and it gets placed almost like the kind of um, a stained glass window in a cathedral looking down over this earthwork by by the Indian so in a way what this curating does is replicate the, the dynamics of colonialism these power relations of colonialism whereby um, the West takes the materials from from um, colonized peoples, and um, and but their own form is apparently unchanged. Whereas when whereas the um, the non-Western work is is placed in a sort of position of subordination. Um, so that's that's the one of the things that, that you know, the curator Jean-Robert Martin claimed was that he was concerned with dialogue and exchange and said he opposed the idea that one can only look at another culture in order to exploit it. But what he didn't acknowledge was that the terms of this exchange were not even, they were uneven. And in the history of colonialism, looking and borrowing are all strategies of domination by which other people have been culturally defeated without their consent. And he defended his curatorial selection by saying that it was di guided by artistic intuition according to my own history and my own sensibility. I think that's really revealing because what he does is he asserts his own Western taste as the sort of ultimate art of possible value. And interestingly also, um, although the curators boasted about how they travelled the world like contemporary explorers looking for artists and magicians, they didn't find any artists of, of the African di diaspora in Europe and North America. Instead, what they focused on was non-Western artists who were not in their case contaminated by godness aesthetic strategies and maintained their authenticity in the seemingly material, um, traditional material processes. Um, So, from that perspective, the sort of radicalism of, of Rashid Amin's exhibition, the other story, becomes very clear. And um, it's interesting that during those, those years of the 1980s and 1990s, artists were very much influenced by, by Fanon and other theorists of, of um, race and the kind of racialized gaze. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about like, some of those. So, um, this is a work by uh, a, an early work by Sonia Boyce, who's, um, who's had um, an exhibition at Innova this this summer. Um, and this is she ain't holding them up; she's holding on some English rose, which is a self-portrait that um, kind of makes a kind of ambivalent comment about the burdens of family life and the expectations of, of femininity. And lots of paintings of this period they have. Um, kind of backgrounds based 
text that refer to, um, on the one hand, Saatchi Barton and the Hoppentop Venus that I was talking about earlier, and also to distorted images of Josephine Baker, who I mentioned earlier also, who was an African-American um, performer who became a kind of huge celebrity in Paris um, uh, and became very famous for her kind of exotic dances, where she kind of performed as a stereotype of, of um, um, African tribalism to a um, kind of Britain audience. But she herself was a very fashionable um, woman who was kind of cultivated her own image very kind of carefully. So what Renee Green does in this work is she makes the images very small and very blurred. And then she she made um, huge sheets of, of text which describe um, which are sort of travellers' tales from colonial um, and um, and also reviews of, of Josephine Baker's performances. So what Renee Green has said that she was interested in doing this work was kind of thinking about Laura Mulvey's notion of the destruction of visual pleasure as a feminist strategy. She was saying, I was trying to figure out a way in which a body could be visualized, especially a black female body, and yet address the complexity of reading that presence without relinquishing pleasure and history. Okay, this is um, uh, a work um, by Fred Wilson called Mining the Museum. And what Fred Wilson was very innovative in doing was working within uh, institutions such as museums with their collection. And this is a, a, a museum in, in the south, of the, in the southern states of, of, of the United States. And what he's done is, they ha it's a sort of decorative arts museum. And what he's done is he's looked through their whole collection, through the kind of items held in the warehouse that don't usually get put on display. And he's rearranged the, the exhibition. And what he's put along the side this silverware is shackles. Okay, so he had a very interesting practice during the, the 1990s that was, was kind of doing an kind of institutional critique. Um, uh, I'm going to sort of move a bit quicker through this. Um, in this work, Cornered by Adrian Piper, she challenges um, the viewer. She seems to be cornered on this screen, right, in the corner of the room. But what she does in her discourse is to challenge the viewer with the fact that um, most white people, people classed as defined as white in, in the United States, have some black blood in them. And during the time of segregation, having one blood, a drop of black blood was supposed to define you as black. So in a way, what she's doing is cornering the viewer, reversing um, the way in which she is torn. Uh, this is um, Mitra Tabrizian, The Blues, which is a series of photographs which, again, dealing with a kind of picking up on the tropes of film noir film to think about the racialized, sexualized days. Um, and here's Rodney, Rodney um, uh, Donald Rodney, sorry, who is an artist who, um, he had sickle cell and some anemia and he made a lot of works that were drawing on the kind of, um, uh, the kind of things like x-rays and so on that were producing a lot of his illness. And this, Highly delicate little house is actually torn through pieces of his own skin. And what he would, what he would, though it's not so apparent in, in this work, though it kind of is about questions of belonging and comfort and ideas of home, in other works he would use these kind of uh, bits left over from his own illness, if you like, to address kind of political issues such as apartheid and so on. So he's an interesting <coughs> artist. Same time in North America, um, very important work was a body of work was being done to address the representation of, of Native Americans um, and the marginalisation of, of Native American artists. So this is a work by Jimmy Durham, a self-portrait, and what it does is he cut, it's a life-size cut, cardboard cutout of the artist's naked, naked body, made with a mask made out of shells and bits, bits of animal hide, and he has very large, colourful genitals. And there's um, one of the things that I love about this work is this opening in his chest above his heart, which is called his feathers. And what it brings to mind for me is Adorno's text, Can Light Art Be Lighthearted? Which is when Adorno was really questioning what was art's role? What was the art of art, role of art and criticism after the Holocaust? And I think that Jimmy Durham is, is, is asking a similar question following the genocide of, of Native Americans. You know, what, and, but there's a lightheartedness about it. He's, he's using humour and, and his own body to kind of really, um, ask quite, quite painful questions. Um, and this is a very famous piece by, a piece by James Luna um, called Artifact Piece, which was um, made in the mid-80s. And for this performance, he, he put on a loincloth and lay motionless on 
piece that they did in 1993, which was called Couple in a Cage, which is a very um, famous uh, performance piece that travelled around various um, museums. And they exhibited themselves as caged Amerindians, a sort of fictional <coughs> of, of, um, um, of so sort of throw, as a sort of throwback to the way in which colonised people were exhibited in the Great Exhibition of the 19th century. And um, the sort of levels of discomfort that we have in looking at this work when you see museum viewers photographing themselves <coughs> in front of the artists, um, and the fact that, that um, although they have kind of signifiers of modernity, such as tracking of the wrong trainers and stuff like that, sunglasses, people thought that they were sort of genuine, genuine, a, a genuine sort of relic from a lost tribe. Um, Coco Fisco has lectured wild, uh, widely on, on the experience of making this performance, and that was one of the ways in which, um, one of their strategies really was to kind of engage with the discourse around the work, um, as well as doing performance itself. Um, so what I've been focusing on so far is the way in which um, uh, a lot of the artists have, have engaged with those kind of um, stereotypes of, 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 of race, um, and also on the way in which they've been so filmed that they've been marginalised from, from um, art institutions. Um, I'm going to skip over that. What I, what I want to sort of turn to now is a different direction, is um, a kind of different approach to live. Um, and um, I'm going um, to talk now much more about work that's concerned with, with the sort of fantastical and ideas of escape, and the way in which science fiction has offered a possibility for reimagining that history. Um, and in a minute, I'm going to talk a bit more about Alan Gallagher as one of a number of artists drawing on science fiction, on Detroit techno, on Afrofuturism, and particularly on um, the, the iconic figure of the musician, philosopher, and poet, San Ra. Um, so, I'll we'll show you a clip from one of his films in a minute, but um, San Ra was, was from Birmingham, Alabama, and he had a very um, difficult um, upbringing there. Um, and he claimed that he had, um, as a young man, he had a mystical experience um, in which he travelled to Saturn and had this mission to return to Earth to rescue um, black people and take them to, to outer space. Um, and in the 1970s, he taught a course at the University of California called black, The Black Man and the Cosmos. And there he met some filmmakers and ended up making this, this extraordinary film, Space is the Place, where he plays himself as a cosmic tra time traveller um, with a mission to save black people from their imprisonment on Earth. And his, the way in which he was going to, to, 
you so big? I don't want you. Well, how do we know you for real? Yeah, how do we know you ain't somebody off the telegraph? Some old hippie or something. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about her? What are you? I mean, we don't know that. She for real. He might have something going for him. Thank <laughs> you. 
um, of the post-colonial yeah. are still relevant today, but they're, they're often being asked from different places. So just to finish up, I want to um, show a work by Nastia Mosquito, who is an Angolan artist, who um, I want to show this work, it's called My African Mind, and I think it's very interesting in that it's an animation which really kind of um, chimes with some of the ways in which Fanon wrote about the experience of, of racism, and it's really about the way it's sort of a processing of kind of colonial images and, and disrupting of colonial images, and making a look at them again, <coughs> and um, question why they're still lingering on and a, a, a burden to
under the consent of the point. A and A. Bullets brought respect. Who are you? Tell us people like monsters. Today, you planned. 